Good evening. It is a joyful time as we are gathered this evening to recognize, uh, to challenge, and to affirm our deacons here at CUNY Baptist Church. As our Lord himself declares on the pages of scripture during his time here in the flesh, he is going to build his church. And one of the materials he is using to do so are his deacons or his servants. That's what we are gathered to recognize together tonight, to be challenged by and to affirm in the lives of these men and their wives who are with us together. This evening we're going to have all of our deacons participate, and so as I thought of these things, and each year we, we try and think through, uh, and have come to the conclusion a few years ago that ultimately it's a grace for our congregation to see their deacons, to hear them challenge and affirm publicly as a group. We'll, we'll speak more of that in a, in a little bit towards the end of this, but I do want to begin by recognizing that, that brothers Dan Herring, uh, Michael Nepper, uh, Jeremy Browning, and Adam Conley certainly are the, the new additions to this group that are being publicly affirmed tonight for their first time of Lord willing many times to come in the future. Even as the rest of you who are deacons as well are being renewed in your affirmation here together tonight. The English term for deacon is the transliteration of the Greek word dakinos. It's a word that we've taken from the Greek and just made it sound more English. And it simply means this, to serve. That's what it literally means in the Greek and in the English, it means to serve. Now to be clear, this is something that's not reserved for our deacons only. For we are servants all, whether you are an elder, whether you are part of this congregation, or whether you are a deacon here tonight. The calling of Christ upon his people is to serve one another uh, and to serve him. Now, as we think about that role of servant, that is a congregational truth or an every Christian truth, it answers one of the common questions that comes up in consideration for the role of deacon. Many times I'll hear, well, I don't need a title to serve. I don't need a title to be a servant. I'm, I'm doing the work. I'm going to do the work. It's not something that's necessary. And yet the Lord saw fit to set aside a specific set of qualifications, and he himself called it necessary. And the reason, I believe, is because it points the congregation in a direction of trust, and more importantly, an example to strive towards that which is common, commands for all believers. In other words, there's no one in here who has a husband, we would say, it's okay because you don't want to be a deacon for you not to be a one-woman man. We would never say, well, if you don't want to be a deacon, it's okay to continue being pugnacious or in some other way to violate these character qualifications. And by no means would we say that. And so it's, it points the congregation around you, the rest of the local body, to an understanding of this is what these qualifications mean embodied in, in action. So you deacons who are here this evening, I want to challenge you specifically about the uniqueness of, of Christianity and the church from the world. That there ought to be that which sets it apart. Now when you consider that, think in terms of what I mean. In our society there is a, a bold claim, it's become a common claim. Hey, it's not even something that's unusual anymore, stating that there is no connection between character and performance. From the highest office in the land on down from there, we hear these types of things continually. Politicians who are supposed to be our leaders seem to lead the charge in this cry. One example I heard recently is a defense was made of a man pursuing political office who had some major failings in his personal life made this statement. Well, which would you rather have at the controls of the airplane, a competent pilot with moral weaknesses or an incompetent pilot with moral character? This is a very poor analogy. It breaks down on several points with but a little consideration through it. And I don't believe that the church is called to settle for uh, some type of a compromise because we live in a generation that calls for it. We're remiss, though, to not recognize this thought pattern is gripping our nation. It's a continual uh, mindset of it doesn't really matter what a man's character is as long as he's able to do the job. Many young people in our generation's heroes are those with little to no moral compass, no character at all, but a great talent at a, or skill at a certain thing. They can play a sport exceedingly well. They have been exceedingly successful in their field, and so many of our young people look to and want to follow after them. 
A columnist in the Chicago Sun-Times stated this many years ago. He said, since most of us would rather be admired for what we do rather than for what we are, we are normally willing to sacrifice character for conduct and integrity for achievement. It's the age-old adage of does the end justify the means? But what we must recognize is that this is not the teaching of Scripture. Scripture places a greater emphasis on what we are than ever on what we do. Hey, we must be something first, and then we do something because of what we are, is the picture given in Scripture. And it makes sense because when you consider it, a person's life is really, it is just a reflection of their character. This truth about character is, is at the core of our Christianity. And this is never more evident than here in Paul's letters to the church, uh, to the leaders of the church, Timothy and Titus, and what we know as the pastoral epistles. And we're going to spend our time in 1 Timothy 3 this evening. If you want to go ahead and turn there with me, if you brought your Bible. 1 Timothy 3, but as we're turning there, we'll go one book further. I want to read from 2 Timothy 2 to, to start us off this morning. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, it's the second letter, the final letter of Paul to his young protege in the faith, Timothy. It's right before his execution. And in chapter 2, he writes these words to him in verses 20 to 22 speaking of what it means to be a leader or a pastor in the church, an elder in the church. He says, now in a large house, there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also vessels of wood and of earthenware, and some to honor and some to dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Now, therefore, flee from youthful lust and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. And as I stand here tonight, I do believe and affirm that each of you who are deacons, especially you four new ones, that I affirm that your desire is to be useful to the Lord in his house, which is the church. But what I want to remind you of this evening most especially is that your character is the key to your usefulness. That's what scripture teaches. We live in a society and a generation that says the opposite, that character has nothing to do with usefulness. But God's word clearly and continually teaches the opposite. And I believe that these qualifications in 1 Timothy chapter 3 are a list for those and of those who are proven in usefulness to their master. Because they reiterate what we have here in our text this evening or in 2 Timothy 2. This evening I want to challenge you men and your wives, your God-given help means to be reminded that what may be accepted and promoted by the world is never the standard for God's people. We don't accept that. We ought not accept that because he has never accepted that. As we do so, I want to give you as our church who are gathered here three things for your consideration as well tonight. Number one is as you hear these qualifications and are reminded of them, I want you to have the confidence in the men who are placed before you. Number two, I want you to see this as a goal in your own lives to pursue after this character. It is not unattainable for any believer, and in fact, is the, it is the model or standard for each of us. And I would ask you to commit to pray for these men and their families. And the load of work that they are taking on and the responsibility of office that they stand before you tonight. As I think on these things, I, I oftentimes... Consider that we can easily miss what a blessing, how blessed we are as a church to have these men and their wives here before us. I've heard more than one pastor say over the years that if they held to a literal understanding of 1 Timothy 3's qualifications, then they would never have any deacons in their church. Sadly, I've seen the damage into the congregation when this view is adopted. So as we're in 1 Timothy 3, the question is, well, what are these character requirements? What does God demand of his men who would be deacons. Well, they begin in chapter 3 and verse 8. The Apostle Paul lays this out as clearly as, as you can imagine he would. And he says this. I want to read it down to verse 13. Deacons likewise must be men of dignity, not double-tongued, nor addicted to much wine, nor fond of sordid gain, but holding to the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience, these men must also first be tested. Then let them serve as deacons if they are beyond reproach. 
Women must likewise be dignified, not malicious gossips, but temperate, faithful in all things. The deacons must be husbands of only one wife and good managers of their children and their own household. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a high standing and great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. So here in these short verses, Paul lays out what are the non-negotiable character qualifications for a deacon. And there's nothing more important than these qualifications in regards to this office or, or this title that we're here to recognize tonight. For our elder interns, one of the assignments that they're faced with every, every new group that comes in, they have to go through each of these with a clear definition in mind for the elder side of it and then do a self-assessment of how they're doing in light of what the, the scripture calls for. I want to do that together tonight, minus the self-assessment. I want to walk through them together and make sure that all who are here have a clear understanding so that you as the congregation might understand with confidence what is being put before you. And you as the deacons might be reminded with clarity of what stands before you. As we walk through them together, we come to the first one. Deacons must be men of dignity. Men of dignity in verse 8. This first character quality is positive in nature, meaning it imbibes something being present, not that which is absent. Some of these call for you not to be something, to be absent of something, but this first one imbibes that which is positive or present in their life. Now, there's a lot of struggle with this. We've redefined dignity at times, and I think we, we, we think in terms of dignity or dignified as being someone who is almost an English butler type of a person, an austere personality with very careful dress code and multiple other things. That's not what the apostle has in mind here. It does not mean an absence of humor. It does mean a presence of seriousness, which allows for true humor, and not silly childishness, but in fact a presence which is deserving of respect, which is deserving of respect. Men who have an established reputation of sobriety in their relationship with others this brings respect and a desire for emulation. The Apostle Paul is putting this before Timothy and saying, find men like this. Raise up men with these character qualifications so that the church, my bride, will be well served in all that I am building. The second one, and I love the, the way the Apostle Paul puts this, it's not a common phrase for us in our English language. It means, it says, not double-tongued. The literal translation would be not having two tongues. Not having two tongues. And what he says here, this word in the Greek, it's only used here. This is the only place in the entire New Testament it's used. And as I said before, it literally means not having two tongues. And the picture that's before us is that this is a man who does not speak one way in this person's presence, but outside of that presence and in the presence of another, they speak a different way. And you can imagine in the body of Christ with all of the unique personalities and people who make up the body why this is such an important thing from, from those who are in an office or, or, or recognition of leadership that they would stand firmly in this. Matthew chapter 5 verse 37 and James chapter 5 and verse 12 address this mindset by exhorting us that we must be those who, who let our yes be yes and our no be no. In other words, Paul is saying that these men's character should be such that men would take your word to mean simply what you say it does. That there would be a sufficiency of that. The third one, as we continue, Paul, again, using language that's not familiar to us, and we translate it as best we can in English, it says, not addicted to much wine. Now, I know that there are many here tonight curious or wondering, well, why didn't Paul say not partaking at all? That would be so much easier and we would be done with any struggles in this area and anything else. Well, I would say this, in their society and culture, wine was the most common drink. It had medicinal and social value, as we can clearly see in Paul's exhortation to Timothy during his illness. I've heard the conversation that wine is considered unfermented in the Bible, but this is not borne out historically nor biblically. There is a word for juice and it is different from wine. And the word that he used here is the word wine and throughout. However, we do know that it was often mixed or diluted with water. All that to say, what our text is clearly saying when it describes a life, this person is it describes a life that is not mastered by anything. 
You're, you're not under the control of anything. And even more literally, it describes one being free from any entanglements. Anything that would entangle or, or keep you from what the Lord has called you to. The next one's actually not far different. It's, it's one of those lust of the eyes and prides of life that we spoke of this morning. And it fits right in there with the uh, not addicted to much wine. And it's not fond of sordid gain. I remember hearing one time that, that an older man said this way, that this man must be drunk with neither alcohol nor greed, that it can't consume either. Uh, either of these can be consuming to a man. And it's important that we understand money is not moral nor immoral. We spoke of this this morning. But here's what that means. Many often point to that and say, well, money is not moral, therefore there's, it's not immoral nor moral. I have freedom in it. And what it does is it almost creates this mindset of trivialness towards it. But this actually is telling us the opposite. Because it is not moral nor immoral in and of itself. It's a respecter of no one. And therefore anyone can become entangled in its pursuit and gathering to a point of considering it more valuable than it ought. It's very dangerous. To have a clear mind in regards to this is essential. He goes on and he, and he makes this statement. This is one of my favorites. I, I love to unpack this with our deacons, with their wives during the initial interview uh, during that time. And it's, it's this declaration that a deacon must be one who holds to the mystery of the faith. Holding, because oftentimes there's great struggle. What in the world is Paul talking about? What is it that is a character of a man that holds to the mystery of the faith? Well, we have to understand clearly what the mystery of the faith is. And it's God's love for us in the gospel. I would point us to understanding and recognize this from Ephesians chapter 3. You don't have to turn there. But as we're thinking on that, the Old Testament is filled with the question. How can a man who is a sinner be made right in the presence of the Lord who is holy? Job himself asked that question. How can a man who is here be made right or stand in the presence of you who are holy. And this is the picture that's given. This is the answer that's given to that question that's asked. The gospel is the answer to this mystery. In Ephesians 3, this is what Paul says, To me, the very least of all saints, beginning in verse 8, this grace was given, to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ, and to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery, which for ages has been hidden in God, who created all things. What is the mystery? The mystery is that God would crush his own son for our forgiveness and then raise him for our hope and that all who would receive this truth in their hearts will live lives reflecting it. Not merely in good deeds, but in commitment to the one who has saved them. This is what the next part of the phrase means when it says with a clear conscience. That you all would have a clear understanding of the gospel. That it would be evidence in your life. That you would, you would hold fast. That you would hold to the mystery of the faith. It would be the unshakable center focus of all that is your life. And then it says this. That you would do so with a clear conscience. Men who not only understand the mystery of the gospel. But they live their life in response to that understanding. Having a clear conscience in life. A pastor of old here in the U.S., a man named Jonathan Edwards, compared the conscience to a sundial. If you're familiar with a sundial, uh, it's, it's a kind of ancient clock. It's very accurate and works well even today. But it's able to give fairly good time by day when the sun is shining. But it is incapacitated at night. In the same way, the conscience is designed by God to function in the light of the word of God. But subtract that light, and the conscience is left in the dark, completely dysfunctional. This is an important truth, man. I would point you continually, and you who are their wives, to point them as well continually. Stay in the Word. Keep the light of God's Word shining upon your life in such a way that your conscience is clearly before you, and that it is clear within you. This is such an important truth. It's so necessary. Oftentimes in our discipleship meetings or other things, or if you have met uh, some of the ladies with, with your discipler, one of the first questions that will come up when you're in the midst of struggle is, how's your study? What are you, what are you studying? 
What are you in the midst of? Is, is the light of God's word shining upon you in such a way that it's, it's bringing clarity and direction, protection, grace, and truth to bear? When we speak of the conscience, it's a continual labor with our young people, whether in student ministry, whether in the school, to help them understand what is the value of a clean conscience. That it's of greater value than silver or gold. This is what another pastor says in regards to the conscience. A pure conscience is one which is not accusing you because you're holding firmly to the truth and obeying the truth. He goes on to say that the stronger a man's theology, the stronger therefore his conscience shall be. Meaning that the stronger a man's convictions, the stronger his conscience will cry out against him if he violates them. It's an important truth to be reminded of. A deacon knows the value of a clear conscience. The next character is not so much a character as much as a characteristic. A deacon must be one who is tested. Who is tested. This is one who is proven in both time and trial. You men who are here before the church and will be presented more fully this evening, you are men who have been doing this work for more than a minute. It's not something that was looked at, and, and we need to recognize that. For you as the church, know this truth. These are not men who we're looking at as men of potential, but men who are proven. They've already been doing the work of deacon. We would never even consider the mindset that we would say, here's a young man with, with great potential. Let's lay this responsibility on him and hope that he grows into it. And these men have been examined and have been recognized for some period of time as having done the work continually. Not men of potential, they're tested. They're not only initially doing, they're initially tested, they're observed. Some of the ways that your names come up is as we meet in elders meetings, both annual times apart and just regular times. As we go through the members list, there's a continual recognition of how's this person doing? Are they doing well? I see them around here more and more. They're more involved. They're more functional. They're more accomplishing. Have we thought about this person? What's going on in their life? Why are they more involved? How are they doing? They're observed. They're discussed. They're questioned. And ultimately, each of these men have been put before the congregation and voted on. But the testing doesn't end there. It's an ongoing testing. It means if ever a man ceases to uphold these characteristics, not in perfection, but if ever a man says I'm unwilling to repent or turn back to the characteristics that I am putting before you tonight, this man would then cease to be a deacon. It's an ongoing, regular examination. This final one, or this next one, is a man has to be above reproach, meaning that there's no legitimate charge which may be brought against them. Now this is important, it's protective for you all. We spoke regularly and, and frequently during your interview time of what it means to be an example to the church, to be in the aquarium, so to speak, if you remember our conversations about that. Well, this is important because it protects you, because it takes out any and all such things as, well, I just don't like that person, or they didn't speak to me. And what it does is it relegates your reproach or lack thereof to these character qualifications that are put in front of us, not to the opinions of men, not to the whims of the moment. It's a protective truth for you all. Now the next few speak to our ladies. These are important as well. It says that they must be women who are dignified, not malicious gossips, temperate and faithful in all things. Now every year I know that there are some who want me to unpack this more fully and understand is this Paul speaking to the women separately for their potential role as a deacon? Or is he simply addressing the wives of the deacons that are in focus here? Well, for this evening, what I can tell you is I'm going to address it simply from the recognition of the oneness of marriage. You wives who are here with your husbands, as they are being called into the office of deacon, as some of you already are married to deacons who are deacons already, and they're being re-challenged and affirmed tonight. Understand that there is a oneness that is given on the pages of Scripture, that you and your husband are inseparable, and that you have specific roles in his life. 
and that he is a reflection of you and you are a reflection of him. And so wives, likewise, be reminded that you are to be dignified, that you are to bear out dignity, that you are to be worthy of respect and emulation, that you would be one that we can point the other young women of our church to and say, this is what it means to be this. Not malicious gossips. It's a strong terminology that's used here. It means one who's not given to grudges nor malice. And this is not the common struggle. And if it is a struggle, it's one you are fighting well against. Now, this is important. And I think it stands specifically to the women because God created women. And he gave them brains which have different storage capacity. Our ladies can hold things in their brains much longer than we as men can. They can hold to a grudge much longer. They can remember an offense seemingly for a much greater length of time. And so the charge is given specifically, do not be one who is given to grudges nor malice. They also have different fight or flight mechanisms. And so their response to the things that are in their minds are different at times than men's. And so this challenge is not given, this, this command is not given without truth behind it. They must be those who are not given to idle conversation, which would ever bring something other than edification or which would ever rob them or others of dignity. The lady's role is an extremely important one. They must be temperate. Ladies, you must be balanced in your pursuits and endeavors. Hey, you must be temperate in the same way that your husbands must also be temperate. Faithful in all things, ladies, you must show yourselves trustworthy and useful to our Lord in all measures. My wife oftentimes in speaking to many of you will tell you continually, you are a Christian first. It's the only thing that you are before you are a wife, before you are a mother, you are a Christian first. That's the picture of what Paul's speaking of here. That you would be faithful to the Lord in all things. This at times means uh, difficult realities in your home. Of taking the stand of help meet in the midst of your husband's life when he is struggling. And this is at times difficulties even within your home as your husband is shepherding you. Calling you to difficult things and for you to humbly support and follow him. Ladies, you have an extremely important role. You have much influence and effect upon the men who are called to this office. Hold it wisely. Recognize it as God has intended. Paul then switches back to the men, and he says that you men, if you were to be deacons, you must be husbands to one only. Husbands to one only. What this picture is, is, is a picture of absolute devotion to your spouse, that would deny anyone the ability to question your commitment. And in so doing, it sets an example to others of this. Now this devotion, it applies to all areas. I think at times this is forgotten, that we think it's only in the area of, of fidelity to our wives uh, physically, but that's not true. This devotion applies to a man's emotional, mental, and physical realm. In other words, this picture is that no other woman can command his devotion in these arenas but one woman, his wife. They must be good managers of their homes. This is an interesting statement. Good managers of their homes. Men who are obedient in the commands regarding their shepherding and care of their families. Men who are hospitable. Men who recognize the utilization of all of their life to the fullness of serving our Lord. The term manager is clear in regards to their responsibility of leadership within their homes. Men are to be those who set the standards for their homes and their wives in partnership with them carry it out inside the home. It's interesting because wives are also called the managers of the home. And this is right and true. They do carry out, oversee, and truly are, are in their own domain in their home. But this is never to, neglect, to the neglect of the leadership of, of their husbands. And so men, do not neglect this. Do not set it aside. Always make sure that you are managing well the homes God has entrusted to you. And a generation, generation that has lost this in so many ways, 
It's even more important that the church at the leadership level not succumb to the cultural pressures in regards to the roles of men and women by our creator's design. In many ways, you will stand very alone in this area, in the society in which we live. To have strong male leadership is by no means a detraction from the strength of our ladies, but in fact is a strength to them. I want to read a quote from a pastor named Richard Phillips. He wrote a book that we worked through with our men titled The Masculine Mandate. And this is what he says about this truth. The order God intends for the local church includes rich and valuable roles for women as well. In healthy churches overseen by vigilant men, women can devote themselves to spreading the spiritual beauty for which they are designed and to nurturing the loving community and relationships in which they are intended to specialize. A strong masculine church will also be a strong church for the display and fruitfulness of godly femininity. A church that is rightly run by godly men who know and apply the wholesome truths of God's word is a safe church where women may blossom in the grace of the Lord. Men, you are to be modeling to the flock in every arena, both church and home, that Christ is your Lord and Savior, and that your desire is to be usefulness, useful to him, even as you walk by faith and obedience to all that he's commanded. It's very important for the men here and for you as the congregation to hear this and know this truth. Scripture does not does hold these men to a high standard as we just as we've just heard. But it does not call them to perfection in these commands. It is not your standard to apply beyond this for it is not possible. It calls them to continual pursuit of them and provenness in their character by the pursuit of them. How they respond in the midst of trial is much more important to what led to the trial. And this is something for us to be reminded of as we consider the heights of these character. And these are the character traits of a useful life to our Lord. A useful life comes with rewards. Good service comes with reward. And Paul makes no, uh, he doesn't balk at that. Oftentimes people struggle with this idea of, well, I don't, I don't want to serve for the reward. Sometimes the reward might be the very thing that keeps you serving faithfully. It ought not be the only thing. But there may be times when it is that which keeps you. It's why our Lord gave it here to be considered. That a deacon who serves well is one who has good standing and great confidence. We see this in verse 13. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. It's a twofold reward. Good standing with men. A man who is respected by his peers and because of his respect is looked up to. Great responsibility and great privilege for honorable vessels or those who are striving for usefulness. There's no greater gift than I can imagine than great confidence or assurance in our faith. There's no greater confidence than to be used by the Lord. To know that as you recognize your life, it is one that is striving after and being useful to the Lord. This confidence allows us to be unwavering in our convictions. When a man spends all of his time, think of this, when a man is striving or spending all of his time convincing you how he feels, he's usually trying to convince himself. It's important that these character qualifications be before you, that you be proven in them, and that you continually strive after them. What a grace to be at peace with your circumstances and joyful in the midst of trial. That's what, that's what Paul is describing here. Hey, that a man who has good standing and great confidence is a man who is at peace with his circumstance and joyful in the midst of trial. Now, as we've said before, these are commands and promises for the office of deacon in the New Testament. That's what we're here tonight to recognize. That's what you men have proven yourself in and are moving forward into. So I close with this wisdom from a pastor who served for more than 30 years. He says this, If it is true that what the leadership is in microcosm, the congregation will become in macrocosm, and he affirms this is true, then the character of those who fill this office of deacon and elder is of the utmost importance. Men, you and your wives set the standard for expectation and recognition within 
the body of Christ here at Community Baptist Church. I would put before you this truth, this weight this evening. And I would call you to love and pray for this church. For God has entrusted her to you and you to her. Church, I would call you to love and pray for these men for the very same reason. I'm going to pray and we're going to recognize our deacons and their wives this evening. Pray together. Lord, we're thankful that your word comes with the clarity that it does. That we're not left to try and figure out what we think a deacon should be. That we're not left to try and figure out how to find them or equip them or prepare them or test them. But Lord, you have given us everything that we need for the, for the care and structure of your church. For it is yours, it is not ours. We are simply stewards who are entrusted with these things as those who will give an account. And so, Lord, I thank you for these men and for their wives. I thank you for the grace that they are here at Community Baptist Church, for the way in which they set a standard, for the way in which they care for, that they model servanthood and carry it forward here in the flock, here within Community Baptist Church. Lord, I pray that tonight we would be encouraged, renewed, challenged, that there would be a greater confidence and assurance for all who are here and what it means to be a part of this body of Christ and that you would be honored by all who are gathered tonight to the recognition of these men and their wives. Lord, we recognize there are no great men. There are only poor, fragile, and frail sinners who are in the grip of a great God. Lord, we praise your name for the way that you have taken these men and raised them up to this role and to the completion of your purpose. Lord, give us strength and wisdom as we strive to follow after all that you have put before us all of our days. And we'll do so with joy and thankfulness for all that you have provided. We ask for this tonight in Christ's name. Amen. We come to that part where I'm going to put an affirmation before you, the church. The men that are about to stand are men who are tested and proven. They've been examined. They've been doing this for some time. They're not unknown entities to you all who are here. You will recognize them each and all. You will have seen them quietly at times working and behind the scenes at many of the things going on here. And not just laboring to serve, but laboring and striving for the character qualifications that we've just walked through. Not in perfection, but in exemplary pursuit. I'm going to ask if all of our deacons and their wives would stand. They're scattered round about the church. And I want to remind you all of the challenge before you. I charge you deacons to inspire faithful stewardship in this congregation. That you would prompt us to grow in our worship of God with offerings of our wealth, our time, and our talents. I charge you to be compassionate to the needs of this body. To hold in trust all sensitive matters which are confided to you because of the office you hold. To set an example that other men in this congregation might strive after in character and service. I charge you to let your lives be above reproach, that you might live as he has called you as examples of Christ Jesus our Lord. Look to the interest of others. Men, if you would affirm your commitment to these, please respond by saying amen. amen. As you remain standing, I'm going to challenge the congregation. I charge you, church, receive these office bearers as Christ's gift to the church. Recognize in them the Lord's provision for healthy congregational life. Hold them in honor. Take their counsel seriously. Respond to them with respect and accept their help with thanks. Sustain them in prayer and encourage them with your support, especially when they feel the burden of their office, and they will. Acknowledge them as the Lord's servants among you. Church, if you affirm your commitment to these men, please respond by saying amen. I'm going to ask if all but the four newest ones would go ahead and be seated. And I'm going to have our other elders join me up here. And we're going to pray for you and your wives. 
The wives can remain standing as well. And as these men come up, we're going to pray for these men who are, for the first time, receiving this challenge, affirming the charge, and making these commitments before you all. And if you would... Our most gracious Heavenly Father, it's by your grace that we're even able to gather here tonight and we praise your name for it. Lord, as we look upon those that you've brought into our congregation to lead, these new ones, Lord, we just hold them up. We hold them and their wives up and we pray you give them wisdom, give them the encouragement, give them the desire to see and do your will in all things. And Lord, give us the desire and ability to help them as they go along their paths, and we give you the glory and the praise and the thanks for it. In Jesus' name. Lord, continuing in prayer, just uh, seated before you is a bunch of sinners saved by grace, and Lord, we all. And then to look out and see the crowd that's gathered here tonight, Lord, and the men that have stood up and proven themselves and heaven a desire and are striving to serve and to be used for your kingdom. Lord, I just, I thank you for them. We're such a blessed church. Lord, I pray that we don't take that lightly. So, Father, I pray for these four and their families and for us, Lord, that uh, they would seek wisdom, they would seek righteousness, they would seek just to love one another, that we would be a church of unity, that, Lord, that you would use us for your kingdom. So, Father, I'm just thankful tonight. We just praise your name. We ask that you'd bless us. We ask, and we just thank you for this time that we're spending in Jesus' name. Amen. Father God, we thank you for the reminders that we've had this evening of the truth that your word contains of guardrails. And, Lord, we thank you for the grace that is on display, your grace that's on display in the lives of these men and women. And Father God, I ask that we as a church would be strengthened through what we've been reminded of this evening to be in prayer for one another and for those that serve this body, and for those of the body, that we would strive after this standard that your word has put forth. And Lord, in the labor of the building up of the body, Lord, that you have promised you will accomplished through your ordained means. Lord, we ask that you would be glorified in all of it. Lord, and in this work, we ask your blessing. In these things, we ask that your name would be made well known through this body and through the people of it. We ask these things in the name of your Son. Father, I begin by thanking you. Thanking for your, you for your love, for the individuals that comprise your church, for your provision for each of us, and the means by which you have continued to do that, just exampled in the lives of these four couples that are standing before us this evening. I thank you for each of them. And Lord, as we go through the consideration of character and the, the weight of responsibility, Lord, I hold them especially up to you, asking for your strength in their life. Uh, for their commitment to you to be at the forefront and the center of, of all that they are striving to do, that it would be a, a steady guide. Lord, I pray that we would hold them up as we ought, both in protection and care, and Lord, that they would reciprocate as you have intended their care and protection back to your body. Lord, I thank you for these men. I thank you for their wives, for the, the goodness of marriage and the help meets that you have provided that is such a essential component of why they are even standing here this evening, Lord. That is, that is your provision and gift, and I, I pray again for your day-to-day -day strength, for your day-to-day -day care, which you have promised and provided, that it would continue forward, and that they, in confidence and knowledge of you by faith, would themselves continue forward. Lord, we thank you that they are being added to those who are serving in a recognizable way. We thank you for the way in which you have cared for this church and pray for its continuance. And Lord, I pray for each of them that are here that your continued care would be evidenced in their life as individuals, as couples, as families, and that this would then transfer into the church. Lord, we ask their, your blessings upon them and upon this congregation, and we do so in Christ's name. Amen.